Hey guys, this is AC Service Tech and today what we're going over is when you have to replace an outdoor unit such as a heat pump or an outdoor condenser. What else should you replace in reference to efficiency, compressor safety, and to avoid future refrigerant leaks? So first things first, you always want to replace the filter dryer. The filter dryer is located on the line set, so it's the copper lines connecting the indoor coil to the outdoor coil. The filter dryer's job is to basically trap any water vapor that's in the system so you have refrigerant and refrigerant oil traveling through the system the entire time that it's running and so the refrigerant and oil are traveling through the filter dryer so if there happens to be any water vapor that's introduced into the system the filter dryer's job is to trap that water vapor to make sure that it doesn't mix with the oil so if water mixes with oil it creates alcohol and acids and so the refrigerant and oil are traveling through the system in order to cool and lubricate the compressor that's located inside the outdoor unit. So if the water and oil mixed, then you have that turning into alcohol and acids that will eat away at the compressor windings, and that will result in a compressor burnout. So anytime that the system's open for servicing, uh, basically you've recovered or you've pumped down the refrigerant, you always want to replace the filter dryer, put a new one in, and you always want to just cut it out. You don't uh, unbraze it out, and you always want to make sure that you have the a new one installed. It has a fixed capacity so you want to check to make sure that it's big enough for the system that you're installing uh, and also there's uh, bi-directional and single directional uh, flows so this one's uh, single directional and that's for air conditioning only. A bi-directional will be for a heat pump. The next thing is the metering device. So this one right here that is called a piston chamber and inside there's a little restrictor called a piston or it's also referred to as an orifice. So this is the same thing you have a piston chamber and then you have distributor tubes. The distributor tubes are coming into the coil here and inside of this you have a uh, this one happens to have a Teflon ring and then you're gonna have a piston. So the piston has a uh, fixed hole that's going to always allow the same amount of refrigerant through into the evaporator coil. Now this right here is called a capillary tube. So you have the, instead of the piston chamber right here, you're going to have the strainer where you have liquid coming in and then you might have one of these or you might have six of them depending on the size of the evaporator quill and this is called the capillary tubes. So that you have instead of distributor tubes coming from a piston chamber, you have a strainer connected to capillary tube or capillary tubes connecting that to the evaporator quill. So inside basically have a uh, a fixed diameter hole and it's always going to allow the same amount of refrigerant through. So these two are both referred to as fixed orifices. Now on a very hot day a fixed orifice is always going to allow just the predetermined amount of refrigerant through so it's actually not going to be able to absorb the heat as effectively as a, a TXV. So this is a thermostatic expansion valve and this can actually modulate the amount of refrigerant going into the evaporator coil. So the refrigerant is what is absorbing the heat in the house and lowering the temperature in the house. Then the refrigerant is traveling through to the outdoor unit and that's where it's rejecting the heat at. So that's why you're lowering in temperature in the house. That's why you are uh, reducing the humidity in the house. It's due to the refrigerant uh, changing a phase inside of the evaporator coil. So this thermostatic expansion valve on a hotter day is going to allow more refrigerant into here to absorb that heat. So the thermostatic expansion valve is actually set to read something called superheat. And it's always going to be set at a certain superheat. So regardless of the heat load across this evaporator coil, it's always going to maintain uh, the correct amount of vapor coming out of this um, system right here. So it has to have what's called a temperature increase in vapor form, which is superheat going to the compressor. If you don't have superheated vapor coming to the compressor, then you're going to end up having liquid going into the vapor compressor and that's going to hurt it. So the other reason why we install a thermostatic expansion valve is in a low airflow situation. So say somebody forgets to replace their filter, uh, their air filter in their house this is going to allow less refrigerant in, whereas a piston chamber is still going to allow the same amount of refrigerant through. Uh, if you don't have enough airflow and you have a piston, then you're going to have no superheat potentially and that's going to go and harm the compressor. Whereas a thermostatic expansion valve, 
is going to allow less refrigerant into this evaporator quill and it's still going to allow, uh, try to allow vapor out of the system and coming over to the vapor compressor. So we install the TXV for efficiency and also compressor safety. The other thing that you want to look at is right here on the evaporator quill, you know, is there an availability to be able to mount a uh, TXV here? So this is a piston chamber, so this you can actually unscrew, take the piston out of the piston chamber, and you can mount a thermostatic expansion valve. Uh, some evaporator quills are not set up to end up changing uh, the metering device like that to a, uh, a, a different style. Um, you can change the piston size in here, but you may not be able to change it to a thermostatic expansion valve. Especially if the system has a capillary tube set up, you're not going to be able to change the metering device. So you'd have to try to unsweat this and it's really not worth trying to change a metering device on a cap tube system. So that's one thing to look at when thinking about should I replace the evaporator quill when I replace the outdoor condenser. So the other thing is um, what I'm finding is I'm finding a lot of leaks at evaporator quills and it has to do with this tin plating right here. So the tin is actually touching the copper and it's having corrosion occur right at those locations. I also have where the distributor tubes attach in, you know, there's oftentimes leaks right there as well. So I try to do an inspection of the evaporator quill and unfortunately the door is usually located right here so you can only see this side, you can't really see the back side unless you cut this out after you've recovered or pumped down the system in order to inspect the back side. Um, but it, it really does corrode pretty well right here. And let me go ahead and turn this around so you can see the back side of it. So here's the issue. Out of evaporator quills, the tubing right here, compared to the line set tubing, is a lot thinner outside wall uh, thickness. And the reason for that is that the manufacturers have made it thinner in order to transfer heat energy easier over to the aluminum fins. As well, the, the tubing that's in the inside of here actually has, a lot of times, a grain in it. And what they're doing is they're trying to increase the surface area in the inside of the tubing in order to once again transfer energy. Well, the problem with that is it ends up creating a potential for leak spots because the wall thickness is, is thinner. Uh, so when you have this tin that's really uh, corroding very well against that, that uh, copper tubing, then you have a uh, potential for leak spots. And I'll have to take you in for a closer image of this area right here just to show you. So here you can see the, the rusting and corrosion where the tin and the thin walled copper meet. And this evaporator cool is really not that old, but I've actually pulled these evaporator coils out before and I knew there was a, uh, a couple leaks in them. I've dunked them in a tank at 150 PSI. I've, I've dunked that in a tank and I've seen six leaks on one evaporator coil. So you think that you're, you're helping the, the situation, you find one, two, three leaks, you fix them and you think, hey, everything's good and you pressure test it and it holds, well the problem is maybe six months down the road or a year down the road now you have another leak or maybe two leaks and that right there is the issue. Uh, when I put my name on a system basically if I'm replacing the outdoor unit and the metering device and the filter dryer and you know the homeowner is paying a, a decent amount of money in order to do that you know they're expecting that the system's going to last for a decent while longer. Uh, they're not expecting there to be a refrigerant leak you know a year down the road. So that's something that you really have to communicate with the customer. You, the, as the installer, we, we have to really examine the evaporator coils in order to make sure that uh, they don't believe it's going to be leaking anytime soon. You know, we do a pressure test on it. We make sure that everything is, is good. But, you know, what I'm doing is if the evaporator coil is any older than 10 years old and it has 10 plates, a lot of times I'm just replacing that to make sure that I'm not going to have a problem in a year, two years, three years down the road. It's one thing when we come to service a system and we find a leak at the evaporator quill, we fix that leak or two leaks or three leaks. You know, it's one thing when we do that, but it's another thing when we go and replace part of the system, you know, and, and then we end up having a leak down the road on the evaporator quill. So it really has to do with the communication with the customer and basically letting them know that if you were to keep this evaporator quill, it, it could have a potential for leaks down the road. You know, the other thing is you might want to replace the evaporator quill just due to efficiency. Maybe a, a new evaporator quill might have uh, three sets of tubing in the inside. You know, the quills are a little bit bigger where there's more surface area and that's going to allow the 
referring to absorb more heat at the indoor coil and reject it out at the outdoor unit. Now I'm not advocating that, hey, when we replace one part, we always replace the entire system. I'm just saying I want everybody to be on the same page communication wise and also that nobody's going to be hit with a surprise a year down the road or two years down the road with this thing leaking uh, and I'm just advocating you know a good amount of communication when it comes to this and I'm just letting you know what I'm doing now I live in a salt environment where you know these these outdoor units are not lasting very long you know near the ocean and uh, so they they may not last 10 years but some contractors are replacing just the outdoor units and they're leaving the indoor units and uh, then there's problems that are occurring uh, so I've chosen to not do that um, on systems that are older than 10, 12 years. So I end up replacing both coils just to make sure that I'm not going to have any problems and that my name is good because what's happening is, you know, you have contractors that are losing customers because they just replaced the outdoor unit <clears throat> and then a year later they're having a problem with a refrigerant leak. And then all of a sudden now they're calling a different contractor because they didn't trust the contractor that installed the outdoor unit before because they don't understand what's happening you know they just put out a decent amount of money to replace uh, their air conditioning system they think everything is new but this is still the older one and now they're having problems so we just want to have the best communication possible with the customer and I'm just trying to relay this information to both sides just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that nobody's gonna have a problem down the road so it's it's terrible when you think everything is fine and then all of a sudden you get a surprise whether that's you the customer or you the contractor so anyway that's what i'm doing and if you want to help support this hvacr training channel check out patreon.com slash ac service tech and if you're looking for the tools and supplies i use out in the field i have them all linked down in the description below hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll see you next time at ac service tech channel